Welcome to Zero Knowledge. I'm your host, Anna Rose. In this podcast, we will be exploring the latest in zero knowledge research and the decentralized web, as well as new paradigms that promise to change the way we interact and transact online. This week, I chat with Chime Kunzang and Francois Garriot from Lurk Lab. Lurk is a Turing complete programming language for recursive ZK snarks. We discuss how Lurk could be understood as a dialect of Lisp, what Lisp is, and how developers familiar with that family of languages would be able to interact with Lurk. We discuss how this compares to other ZK DSLs, as well as the new innovations that it brings to the table. Now, before we kick off, Tanya will share a little bit about this week's sponsor. Ever feel like developing zero knowledge proofs is a daunting task? Well, the team at Risk Zero is here to remind you that it doesn't have to be that way. Their out-of-the-box tooling allows developers to access the magic of ZK proofs from any chain without needing to learn custom languages or build custom ZK circuits. Bonsai, Risk Zero's most anticipated product, is a proving marketplace that enables any protocol or application to leverage fast ZK proofs in languages like Rust, Go, and C++. Visit r0.link forward slash ZK podcast to learn more and sign up for the Bonsai waitlist. You can also find the link in our show notes. And now here's our episode. Today I'm here with Chime Kunzang, co-founder of Lurk Lab, and Francois Garriot, head of engineering at Lurk Lab. And we're going to be talking about Lurk. Welcome to the show to both of you. Hi, and it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's great. Looking forward to it. Shime, this is the first time we're meeting, and I'd like to hear a little bit about the work you were doing maybe before Lurk. What led you to work on this problem? It really came directly out of the work I did on the Filecoin proofs. I led the team that did the implementation as opposed to the research and protocol development of the Filecoin proofs. Uh, so we did a lot of uh, snark stuff and kind of pushed the limits of Grot 16 and discovered a lot of the limits of it in the process. And so after Filecoin launched, that opened up a little bit of space in my brain to think about other things. And I was able to start answering the question, well, what if what if we didn't have to use 2016 technology uh, for the next fun thing that I work on? And, and it kind of came out of that. <laughs> Wait, I want to hear a little bit about this work at Protocol Labs, though. So like there's a snark under the hood. I don't know that we really ever covered that. What are these snarks for? Where is it in that protocol? As you probably know, Filecoin uh, is a blockchain that gives you power based on files that you store. Mm -hmm. And in order for that to work, you need to be able to prove that you're actually storing some particular uh, data. And so there's two different major proofs that are used in that. One we call proof of replication. This is a big, very heavy proof that you've taken some starting data, either 32 or 64 gigabytes, and transformed it into a new random-ish bit of data, uh, which we call proof of replication. And this is what stops you from just making many copies of the same data uh, and pretending that you're storing many copies when actually only have one copy. So this Got replication it. is the unique copy. That's the big proof. And then there's something called proof of space time, which is on an ongoing basis, you keep making a proof that you still have that data. So the blockchain challenges you, says, hey, prove to me that you know one little piece of this file mm -hmm. that you have replicated before. Uh, and that's a smaller, cheaper proof. When you created this, were they kind of created as the same snark, but they're running like a smaller portion? Are they two separate ones? Well, they're quite different. They have some of the same components. Everything is based around Merkle trees. Mm -hmm. um, but the proof of replication, uh, there's a complicated process that is, you can almost think of it as a kind of intentionally expensive encryption that involves sequential uh, SHA-256 hashing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just to show that you've correctly replicated the data. Then at the very end, there's a commitment to the result. So this creates a Merkle root. Then later in post, 
uh, the, the Merkle proof of that same root is used. So there's some overlap, but none of the part that has to do with the original data being turned into the replica ever needs to be proved again. Mm. I, I think I remember the the Filecoin trusted setup. I believe you did one, and I remember it being a, a really long one. Is that true? Well, so with Grot16, there's kind of two different setups that has to be done. One is the powers of tau, mm-hmm. uh, which is general and could be used for many circuits, and then there's circuit-specific ones. At the time, I think uh, there wasn't a powers of tau large enough. I think others may have made one of the same size or even larger since then. But we did sort of the one that's, you know, 100 plus million constraints will Mm. be uh, supported. We we could have done larger, but we didn't want the parameters to be too huge. So in order to make the statements as large as possible, we went for the biggest uh, powers of tau we could do at the time. And then our, our large circuits used all of that. I see. And were you able, though, with your trusted setup, could you run one trusted setup for both of those snarks, like the large one and the small one, given that the small one, I guess, would have been included, like it would have had enough constraints in there? Yeah, you can just use part of the the powers of tau that you need. But we have to still do the, you know, the circuit specific trusted setup for each of the each of different proofs that we had. What were you doing before this? Or was this the first time you were doing snark stuff or had you done anything like that before? No, I had absolutely <laughs> no context for snarks. Uh I think maybe that's that's part of what enabled me to do it because uh before this, I was just doing uh, consulting, working for a, a dev shop named Carbon5. We got brought in to help with the Filecoin node. Okay. And so, I, you know, I was a generalist programmer, but I read the Filecoin white paper very carefully. And there were sort of these holes in the explanation around how these proofs actually worked. And I was fascinated by it. So I kept act- asking all these inconvenient questions. <laughs> and it, it sort of came out that nobody was really actively working on that part. Uh, And so I managed to insert myself in there. And so I I learned on the fly. Got it. It was quite an experience. So this project was your initiation into the snark land? Yes. So after this kind of Filecoin work was completed, you were sort of looking around for something new. When did the Lurk project start? It sort of gradually came online. I would say it spun out of the Snark VDF project. We had been part of the VDF Alliance by we, I mean, Protocol Labs here. And this is with the Ethereum Foundation. I think we've heard about that. Exactly. And originally there was a plan to do this Mm -hmm. um, RSA-based VDF. And they had some issues with the trusted setup around that. Uh, But all all for the last couple of years, I've been working closely with Supernational. Uh, who really helped to optimize our proofs and many other things. Uh, And we were talking about this idea of doing a a snark-based proof. Hmm. And so I kind of took charge of that from the protocol lab side and got that spun up with Ethereum Foundation uh, and Supranational as a partnership. And if you followed that work, you know, some research was done and they came up with this kind of sloth-based uh, VDF. And around that, the question of how, how are you going to make that work comes up. Uh, and there were a couple candidates for the backend proof. It doesn't necessarily need to be one or the other. Uh, we looked at Halo 2. We looked at Nova. We ended up going with Nova. Hmm. But this got me really inside the mindset of recursive snarks. Uh, and I'd already been wondering, you know, what can we do with recursive snarks. So as that work progressed, uh, Lurk sort of co-evolved with that. Got it. And just because you mentioned Nova, I'm assuming the timeframe for this is like summer 2022 or fall 2022. Is that roughly when you were looking at that? So funnily enough, uh, this was in 2021. Oh. Yeah, I'll say something about that. But I, I looked this up for the show, and the initial <laughs> Lurk commit was actually on July 7th, 2021. Okay. Uh, and sort of the, the secret information here is that we've been working with Lo- Nova before Nova was really exactly a thing. Ah. Were you working with Srinath then? Yeah, Srinath is the guy. 
And <laughs> basically what happened is at a certain point, Justin Drake from the Ethereum Foundation and I started talking to Srinath to see, will this actually work? And he was very excited, I think, that people wanted to use his stuff. So we said, well, can you get this licensed in, in the right way through uh, your employer, Microsoft? And that did happen. And um, we started building on it. But at that point, uh, the recursion wasn't fully implemented. The paper had been written, but the implementation wasn't there. But we were still able to understand what it was going to be and start building on top of it. So it wasn't uh, for a little while that it actually became fully usable, uh, yeah. but we knew it would be. Cool, cool. Francois, I want to hear a little bit about your story and where it starts to intersect here. Uh, we've known each other from the ZK community for a little longer. I think we might have met at like a ZK jobs fair or like one of the ZK hack events online. Yes. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> so my story starts a million years ago when I had a, a past background in um, formal proof and programming languages research. Um, I gained a PhD in 2011 in the domain. And then for about three years until 2015, I worked uh, in the Scala community, in the community of the Scala language, doing some developer tooling for, for the programming language. Uh, and then I kind of gave that up for a while until in 2018, a friend I had not seen for 10 years, like bumped me on the shoulder at Facebook. By then I was doing deep learning training. Um, so nothing to do with languages and told me, hey, you know what? Uh, we have this uh, small, teensy, tiny blockchain project. And I've heard that you can do things in formal verification. I'm sure we're going to have bugs. Uh, are you interested in fixing them? And uh, I ended up doing a little bit of formal verification as well as building the blockchain for the GM project. And then I worked on layer ones basically for a long while until uh, somewhere in 2022, the end of 2021. At the end of 2021, I was really tired, like tired of what I was doing, but also mostly tired period. Um, okay. And so I, I swore to myself that if I was going to do anything else, if I was going to start working like crazy again, I would basically choose something that had an indiscutable proposal to novelty uh, and that has an indiscutably Francois-shaped problem to solve. <laughs> um, and uh, Lurk was a match made in heaven. I had been interested in ZK proofs basically uh, thanks to you since the ZK Summit 4. Um, what? If Whoa. you are doing... <laughs> yeah, the ZK Summit 4 was an absolutely crazy event to get into because this is just after Snark Timber this was yes. a small co-working space in San Francisco. Exactly. And basically, it's that one day workshop that invites you to wrap your head around uh, Halo, Marlin, and holographic proofs. So many things Plonk. got introduced, yeah. And Zach giving the no-holds-barred, all-technical explanation of Plonk, uh, which was quite the, the shock. Uh, and uh, other things like the, the transparent snack from dark compilers, like absolutely crazy, crazy work. Mm. Um, kudos for organizing something in like November 2019, um, <laughs> which basically uh, I... That day, I blue screened. Like, I just blue screened from the beginning of the day at the top of the hour, like at 9 to 5 p.m. I basically spent the entire day in a constant state of, oh, my God, what is this? <laughs> and so after two, three years of catching up, uh, the, I, I received an email from somebody at Procolabs telling me the Lurk team is looking for something. And I remember um, having told to Chime before, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to humor the guy. Um, I had a nice conversation you know, push comes to shove, I'm probably not going to get interested, but uh, I'll get a nice conversation out of the stuff. And lo and behold, I got interested. I joined and I've been working on Lurk happily ever since. Cool. All right. So let's actually talk about Lurk. I feel like we've done some good sort of storytelling about where the project comes from, but what is it? Is it a language? Is it a protocol? What is Lurk? Lurk is definitely a language, okay. as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but the nature of the language sort of embeds it into the proof context in a way that blurs some of those lines. Because what Lurk is, is a content address language for data, but Lurk is also a Lisp. And Lisp is a language that really blurs the line between data and programs. Mm. It might make sense for us to define this a little bit, because you just said Lisp is a language, but then you referred to 
a lisp. And I actually don't know anything about this. So can you tell us what that is? Lisp is a large family of languages uh, that have certain characteristics in common. So when I say Lurk is a lisp, I mean Lurk is a dialect of lisp. Okay. What kind of language is it? What, like who uses it? Where does it exist? So lisp was um, very popular during like the previous AI boom when people thought that symbolic AI was going to be the thing. I see. Uh, what era is this? Is this like 2000 and? Eight? This would have been what, like 80s, 90s? Oh, 80s, 90s. Okay, okay. Yeah, way back. Got it. So Lisp is the, in many ways, the OG functional programming language. Uh, it is a programming language that has uh, loud footprints in AI, as Chima just mentioned. Uh, but it is also a programming language that has such a large, loud footprint in the academic world. Every functional programming language that you have heard of um, say the the ml family so the ocamels and and mm -hmm. so on or the the haskell family always a moral parenthood to lisp oh. as this functional programming language that they've tried to uh, improve on change um, another aspect that Chime mentioned is this ability that lisp has to introspect on its own program Mm. Um, which is the foundation of this blurring between uh, data and computation, um, where uh, Lisp create terms that ev evaluate other terms of the same language, which um, um, ties in deeply into the, the way it implements recursion. But originally, it's a creation from the 1960s mm. that is now considered a, a little bit passé, mostly for reasons of trends and culture, but also because it has a descendant uh, that people like a little bit better these days called JavaScript, oh. uh, which morally is another functional programming language. Lisp has had many descendants, including, of course, the ones that we mentioned, Camel and Haskell. Uh, but JavaScript is, at the moment, the, the language that is uh, such a gigantic attraction mm -hmm. to um, 17 million programmers. Um, that the attraction for the Lisp community has been a little bit dimmed by the bright light of, of JavaScript, though there is still very much a community of programmers that work in Lisp uh, and like this meta-reflective, introspective aspects to play with things like macros, for example. That is, as far as regular programming languages are concerned, uh, to my knowledge, none of, of them, except maybe Geb, have such a strong band uh, as Lurk, uh, which is really a proof language uh, that makes proofs about its own evaluation. I see. I want to just ask one language you didn't mention in that list is Rust. Is there any connection between Rust and Lisp? Because I know there's a connection between Haskell and Rust, isn't there? So, so when it comes to f connections between functional, between programming languages, um, you have uh, languages that are, if you wish, this uh, hodgepodge of a lot of connections and um, a very generalist uh, influences that are kind of using everything you could possibly integrate to make the best program programming language. And then there are uh, programming languages that have a very strong bend towards one moral fiber, if you will, mm -hmm. that are a little bit more specialized in their influences. Um, so Rust is in that first category. It's a little bit the rice bowl of programming languages that uses, uh, so it, yes, it has connections to Lisp. It's very difficult to not have connections to Lisp. It's a little bit like not being a descendant <laughs> of JC Scan these days. Um, but uh, the it, it has connections with many other concepts. Whereas uh, languages like uh, the ones we mentioned have this very strict functional programming language bands uh, that essentially relates to how much they deal with statefulness. So very easy to make stateful statements in Rust, a little bit more um, exotic if you if you do it in uh, Haskell, Camel, or JavaScript. The difference means Yes, there's a pound to it between Rust and Lisp, but it's a little bit more faint. Mm. But let me jump in on one thing that you said there, because I feel like because people don't follow Lisp very closely, people don't know a lot about Common Lisp. And Common Lisp is really a multi-paradigm language where imperative programming and stateful, you know, mutable state uh, are very easy to deal with. Lurk is very influenced by Common Lisp, just simply through the accident of my programming history. But in some ways, Lurk backs off of some of the power of common lists 
because of the realities of snarks and of content addressing. Uh, so Lurk is in some ways funny because, you know, we, we don't get mutable content addressing. If you want to, you know, mutate content res- addressable data, you need some abstraction on top of that. Mm. So Lurk is a bit more of a purist than the Lisp community became. I want to ask you about how Lurk, because I think this is really interesting to see, like, sort of the history of, of its creation. But, you know, we've on the show talked about ZK, Focus, Snark, DSLs quite a few times. I mean, I've done a whole episode with Alex Ozdemir. Now, this is out of date. This is like two years old, where he mapped out all the DSLs at the time. And I think there we already had like 12 or something. I think now there's more. So I am curious, like, is this similar to anything that we've seen? Is it at all like Circom or like Noir or like Artworks or like anything like that or or maybe like Leo or Snarky JS. <laughs> yeah, I'm just curious if there's any competition, anything you would put in your category. In many ways, no. Okay, it's um, different. Whoa. <laughs> the idea is that um, a, a lot of the languages you mentioned are languages that aim at performing what we would call direct compilation into circuits. Um, so you take a program um, that is specified by the user, written end to end by the user, and at the end you get a circuit. Mm-hmm. Um, there's nothing wrong with that approach inherently. It's very direct, it's very understandable, but it is what it is. And what it is, is a non uniform model of computation. A non-uniform model of computation is pedantic programming languages for you don't actually quite meet all the terms of Turing completeness. So we aim to classify theoretically uh, programming languages uh, by their ability to be Turing complete. That Mm -hmm. is to express everything that you might want to compute. Meaning by programming language, you have an idea of something you want to compute in your head, you you get uh, Turing completeness. Um, Most languages that are doing direct compilation stop a little bit short of that because they need to model when it comes to circuit. uh, This model of computation by which big programs lead to big circuits, small programs lead to small circuits. It is a little bit uh, counterintuitive to what we are able to do with Lurk and with regular programming languages, which is we have a compiler that will get you the result of the execution and the evaluation of your program, irrespective of its size. And our compiler does not need to be proportional to the size of your circuit. That's mm. where you get the general Turing completeness, meaning uh, it might take a while to uh, evaluate your program, but we don't need to represent it through a compiled program that is as gigantic as your input in order to evaluate it. Mm. Does this have anything to do with the Nova factoring? You sort of mentioned Nova at the beginning, the fact that you're using this folding. Is there something in the snark that it's built on? I don't actually know how to describe this, but, or is that, is that something else? Precisely. Okay. Before you explain that, help me say that better because is Lurk built on Nova? Is it built for Nova? Is it built with Nova? <laughs> I'm, I'm... Yeah, let me try to clarify the relationship there. Uh, sure. Actually, let me just throw one thing in really quickly before I forget. I think that uh, in, in the list of comparable technologies before, we didn't mention Cairo. Oh. Uh, and I think that Cairo is probably the thing that Lurk is most comparable to in terms of the, the kinds of computations it facilitates. Got it. Uh, we could come back to that later if we want to. Cool. Uh, so Lurk and Nova, when, when I first came up with Lurk, my default idea was that Halo 2 would probably be the back end. And then later when the VDF project pivoted to Nova, uh, I became very aware of Nova and had many, many long conversations with Srinat. And Nova became sort of the platonically ideal back end that we think about. But we actually have a Gross 16 back end. We could mm-hmm. in theory have a completely data compatible and I'll explain what I mean by that. Halo 2 backend. What I mean by data compatible is because all of our data is content addressed, it depends on the hashing that we use. And Nova actually uses the POSTA curves partially because uh, I said, Shrinath, like, we use the POSTA curves so it will be compatible with Halo. 
or Halo 2, because uh, uh. we were thinking in terms of this, you know, big picture, big tent view of what we can do with snarks. And if the data is not compatible, the thing is, you're going to have to do all this work of converting data between one universe and another. So we really want to focus on the curves and the hashing representations. So Nova is what we're targeting. And a lot of our plans are based on our knowledge and guesses about where Nova is going to go, uh, because I have a sort of an irrational, it's not irrational, it's actually a completely rational faith in uh, <laughs> Srinath's ability to bring out uh, the, the new hotness uh, month after month. Interesting. I want to ask you, you just mentioned Nova as a backend. I don't really understand what that means for language. Yeah, maybe you can even like help me visualize this a bit. Well, I'll take a cut at it, and then I think uh, Francois will be able to explain it in better formal terms. But the way to think about it is that Lurk as a language, as a Lisp, it's essentially a language for formatting data, like JSON would be, that has a defined interpretation. So we say, here's a piece of data. What happens when I evaluate this? So I'll give you some trivial examples so you get the idea. What if the datum is the number seven? Well, that just evaluates to itself. So you could imagine having a command line, you type in seven, and then the response is seven. But we could also have data that represents uh, some kind of an expression like seven plus six. I put in seven plus six, and then it's evaluated and the result is 13. Okay, so having some rules of evaluation lets us take a data language and turn it into a programming language. And that's basically the Lisp idea. So Lurk deals at that level of abstraction. It defines uh, some semantics and an evaluation model that lets you take some content addressable data, which is like the kind of data that IPFS uses, for example, and evaluate it and then give you a result. Uh, it doesn't really care how you prove that. So this is where we say you can plug in a back end. So we have a Groth 16 and Snark Pack back end, just saying, if you want to use uh, BLS 12.381 to encode your data, and you like the properties of Groth 16 plus Snark Pack, then you can use that. If you want to use the pasta curves, uh, and you like the properties that a Nova proof will give you, you can use that. If you want to use the same universe of data and you like the properties that Halo 2 gives you and you want to stop and write a Halo 2 backend for Lurk, which we haven't done yet, uh, then you can use that, et cetera. Right. So the idea here is that in all the, the backends that we've recently mentioned, uh, Halo 2, Nova, Cross 16, and knowing that the Halo 2 one isn't implemented yet, uh, what we're talking about is backends that are able to do something with a proof as long as it does the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. And this has a deep connection to how you define programming languages on the one hand, and the fact that we have a single universal circuit for all large programs on the other hand. The idea is this. There are some cryptographic backends, namely all the ones that we've cited, that let you obtain an interesting and small proof, as long as that proof is all about doing the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. Now, natively, when you define a programming language, you have to define, and not even talk, thinking about a pro, uh, proof programming language yet. You define your programming language with its syntax, yes, something that people will have flame wars over traditionally, because it's traditional. But you also need to provide how you're going to evaluate this language. And this defines the language itself. You can't just throw syntax at the wall and hope that people will understand how to compute with this. You have to explain to people how you go from the syntax into evaluating the results that you obtain. How do you compute with this language? Mm. Now, what you're defining here is an interpreter. And the definition of that interpreter for a very large class of programming languages, including all the functional programming languages we've, we've talked about, um, Haskell and OCaml, is defined with an abstract state machine. You really think about it in terms of a graph in your mind. So it tells you, OK, you're in that state. If you're in that state and you are facing this particular program, here is how you make progress with the evaluation of that program to move to another state in your graph. OK. Now, you have a graph, depending on how complex your, your programming language is, it may be big or small, 
uh, Lisp is rather small. And if you look at advanced and late, later and modern programming languages, they get a little bit, bit bigger. But the idea is there are nodes. In between those nodes that are the states, the partial states, the, the steps, the milestones in the evaluation of your program. And the edges describe how you go from one milestone to the next. And all of those edges are directed and flow towards the final evaluated form of your program and tell you this is the result, what you have computed is 13. That sort of graph has a step function. That step function is the name given to the union of all the edges. How do you maintain your state across the evaluation of your language? That step function is precisely what you execute over and over and over again. Mm. So the definition of your language is in fact equivalent to the definition of the step function of an abstract state machine. Now, this is unusual if you have not formally studied programming languages, but if you have, this is literally your textbook. Um, mm. There are professors that will you make you work through that model on a regular basis in nearly every university. The Lisp standard traditional abstract state machine is a thing named the CEK machine for control environment continuation. Continuation doesn't start with a C, but don't ask. Um, <laughs> And that CEK machine, uh, which was uh, out of the works of uh, Matthias Felizen and co-authors a million years ago, is what we've implemented to evaluate our Lisp. Or more exactly, since we have a dialect of Lisp, we have a clever variant of the CEK machine that still has a very strong moral parenthood. Once you put that in a circuit um, and you express this in a circuit, this machine is universal in that it can take any Lisp program and then through iterated applications of this state machine, moving to the graph, evaluate that program. And that is how we have a universal circuit, and that is how we've implemented a Lisp. You just said, though, you would take a Lisp program. Would it mean that someone interacting with this would write in Lisp, or is it in Lurk? Is it an existing program that it reuses, or...? So, yes, it is the Lurk program. Uh, so you would write in Lurk, uh, which happened to be a, a dialect of Lisp. And through speaking a little bit fast, I may have mentioned a Lisp, Lisp program. But what I really meant is that it would be a Lurk program if you want to call the, the Lurk compiler. Yeah, the, the best way to think about it is just to remember that Lurk is a Lisp, where Lisp is a broad family of languages going back to, you know, an McCarthy's 1960 paper. It's basically, you know, just the way to turn the Lambda calculus into a programming language as fast as possible. Okay. This is definitely more in the deep language land than I'm, than I, I'm not a developer, so it's, it's hard for me to fully follow this. What I am getting though, is that it's a unique construction. And what I want to understand is like, how do people actually interact with this? We had talked about these other DSLs, which like those to me are kind of clear like the they're either trying to create circuits with a language or they're trying to black box the zkp and then you can create private applications using these things but in in this case like what do people use this for so you would interact with it in the same way that you do with a zkdsl but with a few key advantages that will put your mind at ease <laughs> In the, the correct intuitions about your execution. One thing that uh, programmers of vanilla programming languages have as an intuition is that if you have a program that has 10 different branches, meaning you have a, a case statement or a large if with many alternatives, then the only thing you should be paying for when you're running to that program with a particular set of inputs is one of those branches, not all 10 at the same time. But in our NCS or in a, a circuit organization in general, you end up paying for all those branches, including the ones you don't take. Mm. It's the same thing when you're uh, looking at a big for loop that runs through um, one to 500 iterations and has an early stopping case. You know, a break statement that tells you, no, no, I'm actually finished with, with that for loop. You would assume that the only thing you pay for is maybe the two iterations until you break out of the for loop. And it actually is the case that in a 1CS, you end up compiling this to a for loop that runs 12, 500 iterations. The idea is that um, circuits in general 
don't have control structures. They are literally a, a wired out, drawn out structure that has no ability to jump at different points of the execution. This has led to very famous issues, such as uh, if you have a decision by zero in one of the alternatives and you happen to not be in that branch, you will still error out on the division by zero. But the point is, Lurk, by running, modeling the evaluation of your computation, rather than a declarative description of your computation should be, which is what the circuit, direct compilation circuit DSLs are, um, allows you the ability to recover your intuitions. Your intuitions are that you walk through a program, you jump at particular points of that program when it's written out, and Lurk is perfectly able to do that for mm. you. I still don't understand, though, what kind of program would it be used? I think I need something a little even higher level here. Like, what kind of application or thing would live in this ecosystem? Are you using this to develop, like, a roll-up smart contract? Or are you using this to develop a application or am I am totally am I in the wrong category altogether? <laughs> this is correct on both both counts. And okay. the difficulty in in relaying what is going on here is that the model is so general and we are in a world and an ecosystem where a lot of tooling is specializing things a lot. Yeah. So yes to the roll-up, yes to, to the generic proofs that uh, uh, happens to be about cryptographic elements, uh, and very much yes to a ZKML use case that potentially would have absolutely nothing to do with blockchains whatsoever. Okay. Huh. The idea here is that we don't want to operate under vendor locking assumptions. You can write your proofs and there are difficulties here to adapt to any particular use case, and we have definitely worked on making sure that you had toolings for those use cases. But you can write a proof about things that talk about a Merkle tree and maybe talk about the correctness of some cryptographic signatures. Uh, you write that in your list dialect, and ta-da, you've written a ZK bridge. Or you can write something about the processing of a particular picture and turning that picture into grayscale uh, and then maybe cropping it. And that's a very famous use case about um, the fact that the latest Sony A Alpha 7 Generation 4 cameras have the ability to sign stuff. Uh, and this is uh, work by Dan Bonnet and uh, one of his uh, PhD students, primarily Trisha Data, where you can definitely take a picture, prove that it was taken um, and geostamped at a particular lo locations, and then you want to process it before you display it on the BBC's website, mm -hmm. right? Therefore, the signature that you have on the original picture does not carry over the reduced, scropped or grayscaled image that ends up on BBC's website. And that's what you see. You'd like to verify the authenticity the provenance of that picture. But if you wanted to write this, um, this is what we're building towards. We want Lurk to give you the ability to build this use case that expresses image processing and makes a proof of the result of that image processing. Interesting. So what would they use right now without it? Would they use a mixture of these DSLs that I just mentioned, or they have to create a lot of their own stuff? So uh, you have several options. Um, you have the, the direct compilation TSLs that have the limitation that if you are writing a relatively long program because you don't have any inherent link to recursion that would allow you to compress the, the size of your proof, uh, you're limited to a certain size. And then there's also the, the, the disadvantages we mentioned. What would an example be that we might know? There, the, the traditional description would be a Socrates. Uh, Circum, if you are not plugging it, Circum is very much a front end. So if you're not plugging it with a inherently recursive backend, the classical examples. And then you have the, the DSLs that have some, even some of those DSLs that are doing direct compilation are kind of shoehorning you into, let's say, their major or main blockchain of application, right? Taking Leo uh, and using it uh, in a context completely separated from Alio is uh, theoretically possible, but this is not necessarily what the tool is being designed for mm. at the moment. And then you have the VM models, the virtual machines um, that have this advantage of having this ability of uh, creating succinct proofs independent when they have recursion. They have the ability to, to of creating small proofs, but they are in many ways 
relatively heavy weight and bring in a modelization for the ones that are ZK EVMs uh, of the data model of Ethereum that you may or may not care about. Yeah. The data model of Ethereum is great, don't get me wrong, for a certain class of proofs. But if do you care about Patricia Trees if you're doing image manipulation? Maybe not. And an example of that, I guess, would be something like Risk Zero, right? Ah, uh, so Risk Zero is one of the very few um, generic virtual machines. Oh, so what you mean then is more like the ZK VMs, something like Maiden. So the ZK okay, okay. EVMs. Or the yeah. ZK EVMs specifically. Maiden actually has a claim to generality. Okay. But, um, but Maiden and Risk Zero are, are indeed generic VMs. So they might serve your use case. You might do image processing with them. That, that might work. But they have a different trade-off. Uh, and the most fundamental one is the idea that they are those low-level VMs. And so you're a little bit further from your proof intent. You don't directly program in RISC-V assembly. You don't directly program in Maidon assembly, which is very much part of their value proposition. The idea of selecting the RISC-V intro set is to say uh, to everyone that wants to hear that, you're going to compile to risc zero. But at the same time, that comes with consequences. So the most obvious one is that the proof that you obtain as a cryptographic artifact at the outcome of this is a proof that has been made on the input language of those virtual machines. So if you're making a proof with RIS0, you get a proof on the RIS5 infrastructure set. So it's the proof is about the RIS5 assembly. That may be something that you're willing to audit, and that may be something that includes no errors, but it also may not. Mm. That is, if there is a bug in your compiler uh, from your source language, whatever it happens to be, and compiling into RIS-5 assembly, then that bug may, let's say, remove some statements from your original program. And there may be something missing in your proof. Hmm. Of course, I'm speculating. Um, I am not saying that this is the case for, for particular um, cases. But I want to highlight a more interesting thing, which is that if you're going to write directly in Lisp, in Lurk, you have the advantage of having an auditable program in which you literally write down your proof intent. This is what I want to write a proof about. And you get a direct proof on that and nothing else. Mm. Yeah, I want to jump in there because I think this is an important point when you think about what the future of zero knowledge proofs and the data they operate might look like, because we're still really early in this. But if you think about the dream of content address data, like we have Filecoin and a universe of data that people want to make proofs on and manipulate, there's going to be more and more uh, zero knowledge proofs at the application level. And it's really important that there be a lightweight way of doing this that people can understand. Mm. Like with Filecoin, we had kind of the luxury of taking a really long time to write these proofs and they're very heavy and they had to be audited, et cetera. But what we really want is just, I as a regular old programmer get up in the morning and I need to do something and I write a little program and I have the data available to operate on, I give you the proof, and then that's sort of good forever. Mm -hmm. uh, and the really interesting thing about Lurk is that Lurk is just sort of a content address data language that's very expressive. And it's directly interpreted by the Lurk proof circuit. So for example, if I want to prove to you, hey, I know of some data such that uh, if you perform this mathematical function on it, uh, you'll get some other result. I can just write that. I just write that down in the simplest possible way as an expression tree. And that's really all Lisp is. It's just a way of describing an expression tree. Uh, and I can say, this is the case, and here's a proof of it. And the nice thing about that, that artifact is really durable. I can put that on IPFS, I can put that in Filecoin, I can put that on Ethereum, mm. and anybody who can, who can hash that uh, expression and check it can say, oh, this is a proof that that's true. So there, there's no assembly language involved. Nobody is decompiling this and saying, you know, is there a bug in 
you know, this assembly language or something, they're just saying, you're telling me that you know of a number such that that number times seven is 56. And I'm saying, yes, I do. And you say, I can't imagine what that number would be, but I trust you because you have a proof. Hmm. You just sort of mentioned the interaction with some of these other blockchains and stuff, but like, would someone create a VM with Lurk that then lives on a blockchain? What you just described about like how you can you know, you can look into the blockchain, maybe prove something from it, but like, how does it connect to an actual blockchain? And which one are you focused on? You mentioned Filecoin and stuff like that, but like, yeah. So there's two aspects of that. And and there's the simple verifier and then the content addressing. And I'll let you may talk to the, the content addressing. But the simple aspect is there's no need for a VM. And this is really important. You just need a simple verifier contract. We produce proofs um, that, under reasonable assumption of choosing a backend, are simply verifiable on chain for um, a modic cost. The aspect that is interesting is that we are therefore not assuming that you need a VM. Mm-hmm. And yet, because we are micro VM, we give you the, those important advantages of recovering a computation model that is intuitive to you. Mm. Um, if you're doing a civil authority stance on a number that is not prime, you should just pay the price of a few iterations, not the entire uh, sequence of operations. It's important if you look at ZK Bridges, for example. Um, we are converging towards basically rollup centric architectures on every other blockchain today. Every other blockchain is at the moment focused on how do we build a rollup SDK? Rollup SDK is fantastic. They let everybody develop their own new rollup. But every new rollup, every n plus one rollup that is successful, immediately creates a need for at least n bridges, right? Because now everybody wants to bridge to and from their local blockchain or their local rollup into that new rollup. And what are we going to use for that ticket bridge? Either we use the multi six bridges that are what they are and have led to the amount of hacks that we're well aware and that have a security problem. Or we use actual ZK bridges. Cool. We can either de- define those using the direct compilation model we've had so far, which means find six top cryptographers and um, enclose them into a cabin in the woods until they come back with a second definition of your light client protocol. Good luck with that. Or we adopt something recursive, a VM model. But if that VM model is something that is that low level, suddenly we're getting into compilation, modelization of the data model of the uh, of the chain, and that gets a bit complicated. Mm. Whereas if you have a quick skirting language, that goes a lot faster. So you can prove off-chain, define a list program, and then put the verifier on-chain on any chain. Where does the prover actually live in this? If it's not, you sort of mentioned it could be off-chain. So where does it actually live? Right. So the the nice thing is it sort of doesn't matter. So this is a practical question. What we would like to see is cheap and efficient proving services that can make these proofs for you. And which one you want to use, it likely depends on what, what kind of contract you need with them, how much privacy you need. Now, we want this to be efficient enough that if your answer is, you know, the only person I trust to make this proof is myself, then you say, okay, you know, buy yourself a nice computer and make the proof at home. But once you have the proof, that artifact itself can be verified anywhere. Mm. But we'd certainly like to see, you know, a centralized or maybe decentralized network of provers that really get down to uh, the basic cost of making these proofs, which is is not going to be that expensive because GPUs are cheap. Uh, if we have enough success, ASICs will make the proofs even cheaper. The nice thing is that given the way that Nova works and everything else, we will be able to, in a future version of Lurk, separate out the parts of your proof that are truly private, that I want to take advantage of the zero knowledge properties versus the parts where, you know, I don't care. Anybody could make this proof for me and I'll get it at a very low commodity cost. And uh, the nice thing with that is that we also aim to use all the efforts that we as a species have all involved into writing very clever circuits. The fact that Lurk has a design that is 
moving away from circuits is actually not a bad statement about circuits. Circuits are useful for some things. In particular, I mentioned that Lurk has a universal circuit. Um, and when I said it has a universal circuit, I'm not lying. It's a circuit, right? We've wrote one. Um, so we would be ill-placed to poo-poo circuits. Circuits are very useful when you don't care so much about the developer experience, but you really want to squeeze out that every last bit of performance. You want to describe your operations in a very minimal fashion. And we have integrated that in the language. That means I told you Lurk has a universal circuit. It is a dialect of Lisp that is evaluated entirely to one single tiny circuit. By the way, our circuit is 12,000 constraints approximately. We're talking about half the size of the circuit of a SHA-256. It's really, really tiny. But if you want the Lisp dialect that we offer you to have very efficient operations for a few interesting functions that are key to your use case, well, you can write a circuit for it, making it a bit more performant, squeezing every last piece of performance. You can use our one CS today. We have this notion of coprocessor that you can program the Lurk circuit for in order that those functions can be interpreted in the language using your circuit you, you, you plug in. Hmm. Of course, uh, it, it requires a little bit of setup in your proof. But basically, if you've done a lot of work uh, using, at, at the moment, bell person definitions of, the, of your gadgets and very shortly circum, you have the ability to reuse all that work for a very cleverly designed circuits and have it available as a native primitive of the language. So you have Lurk, the universal Lisp dialect, and then Lurk Prime, Lurk Seconds, Lurk, your favorite customized variant of Lurk that also happens to do, let's say, image transformation or hash functions really, really fast. Mm. There's a model that people are probably familiar with for thinking about this, which is, um, the way that most Python programs work that need to do something non-trivial. Uh, you have Python, which is a language people like. It's a high-level scripting language. And then you need some performant piece, and you have a library. And that's written in usually C++. And from the Python programmer's perspective, they've never left Python. They're just still writing a simple, clean, easy-to-understand program. And it can be audited in that way, too. And then if you've also audited or for some other reason trust the backing library, you get the performance of it for free. So we're early in support for this, uh, mostly because we don't see it as a very hard problem. Like everybody already knows how to make these performance circuits. We know that it's very time consuming and difficult. It needs to be audited very carefully, but it works really well for the problems it works for. Lurk just lets you plug those in. You can just, we basically think of it as an FFI of a Python program with the C++ library. We say, just pretend you're writing in Python here, but we'll give you the performance of the C++. So if we wanted, you know, the circuit for SHA-256, we just take one, plug it in, and write a little wrapper for it. Um, and that's really our model. But the thing that's most interesting about this because of Lurk being a language, is that in the future, we're going to be able to compile custom circuits from the Lurk surface language into efficient circuits. And this is going to be the thing that actually cuts down on that development time and gives you both sides of the picture. But mm -hmm. that's that's a little ways off. That comes from my um, experience with deep learning frameworks, uh, where I've met a number of C++ programmers uh, that had this um, joy in contributing to deep learning frameworks, telling me my specialty is really this difficult backend language. But when I integrate that into one of the numerical backends of a deep learning framework, it makes my work relevant to a much larger class of programmers. We don't want zero knowledge proofs to be owned by cryptographers forever. Mm. But we do want to give them the joy of making their work in writing a specialized circuit relevant to a much larger class of proof programmers. Neat. I want to ask about the Lurk ecosystem or the stack. You know, we've talked primarily 
about a language, but you did sort of talk about it potentially having these other dimensions. So what is, maybe not what it is it is today, but what is your plan for what this looks like? Do you s- sort of follow some of the other DSL models of getting, I don't know, lots of tooling built around it? Or yeah, how are you, how are you approaching this project? And, and yeah, what's the sort of roadmap vision? The, the very nice thing about Lurk is that it has this very small footprint between the proof intent, your program, and the actual cryptographic proof. There are very few things that you need assurance on to make sure that the entire thing is completely secure. So what we're actively working on is formal verification of the entire Lurk stack. I was which... about to ask that, actually. <laughs> Crazy. Right. Okay. So basically, that means that we have already run through an audit of our Lurk circuit, uh, which is relatively small and that we're very confident in. And the Nova code base is a very high quality uh, code base led by Srinath. But it would be even nicer if we had a tooling-based formal verification of the entire stack, and its small size makes it amenable to that in a re- on, a, on a reasonable timeline. When it comes to tooling, one of the nice things is that we can import the existing tooling that exists for Lisp. Um, this is very nice mm. when you want to work with an editor to just have everything set up already. But of course, we can take the things a little bit uh, further. Lisp is really the core abstract um, moral language of what we're developing, but we also have empathy for the 17 million JavaScript programmers that are at the moment working with JavaScript. And it turns out JavaScript has this such a strong parenthood to Lisp that it is one very small transpilation task away from Lisp. Meaning you take Lisp, you remove all the parentheses, replace them with scoping rules, add a free braces, ta-da, you have JavaScript. What that concretely means is that once we have this transpilation done and ideally verified, suddenly we have this high level language that is entirely verified and that you can have exceptionally strong assurances on that can power all of Web3. Mm. We built Web2 with JavaScript, not assembly languages. And the idea here is let's try to be build Web3 with a JavaScript rather than assembly languages. That might absolve us from levels of complexity we don't necessarily need. This is small and beautiful, and ideally in the very short future, formally verified. Let me try to describe what I think is the most important thing about Lurk. The most important thing about Lurk is that it just happens to create a whole bunch of rhymes that are inherent in how Lisp works, in how content addressing works, and in the needs of zero-knowledge proofs. And the really important thing is this identity between programs and data. Because in Web3, we need to have everything exist as immutable data so we can content address it. And Lisp takes that as a given. And so Lurk lets you take data that's in the format that it needs to be in, in order to work in this world that we have, and do nothing else to it and have a well-defined program. And the nice thing about Lurk's actual technical design is that you don't have to follow these content addressable links or pointers any more than it is needed to evaluate your proof. This is for the prover. And for the verifier, uh, whoever is having something proved to them, they don't need to follow them either. So the, the prover can hide secrets inside their proof. They can say, I know of some data that has these properties, and you can absolutely believe that. And we think that Lurk proofs have some really good properties computationally, but what's more important really is that what we need, if we're gonna build up a huge universe of content addressable data that proofs can be made over, is that data needs to be durable. It needs to last for a long time because producing it is expensive. And you want the proofs that were made in the past to remain valid. We want a corpus of you know, data that grows forever and that we know things about. Uh, and so really, Lurk is a data language first. And the fact that you can make proofs over it kind of 
uh, completes the idea. Uh. But even even if it were to turn out that uh, lurk proofs were not the best way to make proofs, you would still need a data language like this. So really for us, the tooling and the ecosystem is about trying to get that language expressive enough that we can build the future on it. And if eventually it turns out that uh, there's some better way to compile Lurk programs, you could say, fine, then the Lurk proving part isn't as mature as it will be, but we want to get that language right. Uh, and that's why Francois was talking about JavaScript. Uh, you know, we realized uh, the world has kind of figured out a way that it likes to express these kinds of things. We have JavaScript and then we have JSON, mm -hmm. right? Like it works for people. And, and moreover, lots of the world's data is already like that. So we're kind of leaning into that. So we see the tooling building up around that. How do we make uh, it possible for regular people to express their data and write programs over that data in a form that's actually useful. Mm. Uh, and if they can get proofs out of that, great. Yeah. So that's kind of the roadmap. How can people already interact with Lurk? And what are you on the lookout for as well from potential co contributors or maybe other works that are coming up? So when it comes to uh, Lurk, we are at the moment uh, making sure that Lurk is the right language. And that means uh, we've talked about JavaScript, we've talked about coprocessors that allow us to reuse circuits. We are extremely welcoming of feedback from users that at very specific spots, they care about particular um, features to be avail available in the language. But at the same time, we are in the core business of making sure that Lurk is the best programming language to stand up over a recursive process which means that we consider the recursive proof system to be community good. It's not necessarily ours. We want it to be state of the art for everybody out there, mm -hmm. which means we contribute to the Srinas Nova project and we will for sure keep contributing and extending that project, but that we also would like to federate and help a bunch of people that are working on the absolute deluge of work in that area from uh, Supernova and CCS, this new arithmetician from uh, uh, Srinath and, and Riyad Wabi and Justin Taylor, Hypernova, which is this uh, new work that is addressing how, how to do Nova based on high degree gates. But we've also helped uh, Nicolas Monblatt working on Sangria for uh, adapting it to Plonk until Hypernova made that work obsolete. We've noticed the fantastic work from Espresso <laughs> System on Protostar. Yeah. Um, and uh, the experimentations of the Privacy Scaling Explorations Group in uh, making um, Nova proving parallelized. Paranova, I think is what they call yeah, that. <laughs> indeed. And this is super exciting. So here we're just looking to be ourselves, nice collaborators that help make sure that all of this work basically evolves to some sort of engineering focus folding endgame by which we have the absolute best software tooling that allows us to make efficient and very generic proofs. Mm. Uh, if you like Lisp as well, we have a standard library for Lurk that could take a few contributions. Um, we are really thankful for uh, the contributors that have already worked on um, Lurk. The Glow um, you can team that has worked on compiling a smart contract DSL into Lurk already. Uh, we've had a help from uh, Neda Amin, programming languages researcher at uh, Harvard that has helped us figure out the intricacies of reflections and mac macro systems in Lisp. We've uh, ourselves formed Lurk Lab out of a fusion with uh, Yatima, which was initially team focused on the Lean theorem prover. And that is, of course, uh, extremely valuable for our formal verification effort, but it also means that we have empathy and care for the improving community. That list uh, is bound to get bigger over time, and that is extremely exciting for us. Cool. Well, thank you to both of you for coming on the show and sharing with us the story of Lurk. 
explaining a little bit about Lisp, for explaining to me a little bit about the Lisp history. And um, yeah, thank you so much to both of you. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for having us on. We appreciate it. That was really, really fun. Cool. I want to say thank you to the podcast team, Rachel, Henrik, and Tanya, and to our listeners. Thanks for listening. <laughs>